Joining us now in Studio B is the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. We can talk gymnastics if you want, but I, I think I want to start with basketball, if that's okay with Let's you. Let's do Greg. that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Given the rough timeline from Mark Pope, seven to ten days for Yoli Childs to return from his finger injury, when do you expect him to show up in the BYU lineup again realistically? Don't know. How about that? Uh, it'd be great if he only misses four games, which would put him on the floor next weekend, which would be, what, 16 days after the injury? Yeah. Yeah, I guess really it all depends how the wound heals and how, you know, painful and flexible the finger feels. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's the best case, right? Get him back after only two weekends missed. That'd yeah. be great. That'd be kind of the narrow end of it, I think. Um, but, yeah, uh, that that's what, that'd be the hope, I think. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Um, and, and San Diego Thursday, certainly one that BYU can handle without Yoli Childs. Um, and then at Gonzaga is an interesting one. How do you kind of gauge what we're going to see Saturday where BYU doesn't have its best player in the game yet you want to compete and just see what happens because you always went up there a couple times i think being competitive would be impressive and a win would be legendary quite frankly i mean byu's won up there but they've they've not been shorthanded like this um you know the chances of beating gonzaga without your leading scorer and rebounder increase the odds pretty considerably you know that said again it would be an epic legendary performance if they were to get a win up there uh, as it stands just being in the game and, and hanging with would be, uh, I, I think, not, not exactly mission accomplished because you want to get the win. But I, I think BYU showed a lot of things just last week in, in taking St. Mary's to overtime uh, without Yoli. And, uh, you know, BYU will have played, you know, roughly about two-thirds of the season without him uh, by the time he gets back. That was not the expectation uh, when BYU found out he'd be returning uh, for <laughs> oh, another year. Oh, you'll come year. for a third of the season? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, and, you know, if he gets back and healthy, then he can add, you know, some, some numbers to it by the end of the season and increase that, you know, that number. But right now, you're looking at a little more than maybe, best case, a little more than half the season with him, you know, and to still get the number of wins BYU's gotten, I think says a lot about this team. And the thing is, I, 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 I believe in these guys, and, and they certainly believe in themselves. Um, they knew coming in they'd play the first nine games without Yo, and they responded accordingly. They didn't think they'd have to do it again, but here they are doing it again. But these last two games last week, I, I think, showed that uh, this team believes it is a team and not overly reliant or dependent on just one guy. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer, and, and I've just been super impressed by everything they've done to, to this point. Greg Rubel with us on BYU Sports Nation. Yes, here we are. Yoli Childs hasn't played the majority of the season. BYU is a nine seed in the latest ESPN Bracketology, according to Joe Lenardi, which is a seed better than St. Mary's, shockingly. And how great is it, by the way, not to interrupt, just to be uh, in the mix again? Yes, oh, it's just, right? it's absolutely. Oh. I mean, for the last few years, just being on the outside looking in and, and, and checking NIT brackets and all those kind of things, not where you want to be. And, and this is – you're in the thick of it right now. And it's just a, it's just a great feeling to have a BYU in that position, what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I love checking out the team sheet. Absolutely. It's, ones, it's so we're fun. Paying yeah, it's great. Okay, we're paying attention to what everybody's doing in the West Coast Conference because it helps bolster or right. pull down BYU's resume. It, it's just fun. That said, with St. Mary's losing to Santa Clara and having lost to Pacific – is BYU the second best team in the West Coast Conference? Well, that's going to be, I think, what puts BYU in the best place to, you know, to 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 make the dance is being the number two. I mean, granted, you want to be the number one. You're trying to beat Gonzaga and knock him out of the top spot. If you can't be the champ, I think the second best team to Gonzaga in this league is an NCAA tournament team. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, and BYU's not been in that position to where, since they went to the new format, of course, getting a double buy or a triple buy, I guess this might might be in this case, to the, to that Monday semifinal. They'd be in a great spot if that were the case. Um, so St. Mary's has already lost to two teams. BYU's yet to play. But if BYU is able to do against those two teams what St. Mary's did not, then that gives you a leg up. On the, but then you've got to worry about those two teams. And, and well, how long will Santa Clara stay uh, with the record they've got? And, um, and, and Pacific looks to be better, just how much better. Uh, it's a little early to tell, but uh, I think the depth of the league, I think we can say, has improved. Uh, the fact that, you know, your, your lower-ranked team, or maybe till last week, maybe your lowest-ranked team, Portland, you know, led Gonzaga at halftime, beat USF. Yeah, BYU handled them pretty well, but that team had already shown well uh, in its first uh, couple games. And so I think the overall quality of the league has improved. I think people nationally uh, are thinking of the WCC as a multi-bid league every year. Uh, you know, Joe Lunardi last night, uh, you know, retweeting in response to somebody about how you can, you, can, uh, you, you can infer by the fact that St. Mary's lost to both Santa Clara and Pacific, you can infer that the WCC is a lot better than it's been top to bottom, and I think that's true. Yeah, and, and that's awesome because that means if BYU can have – there can be multiple bids. Now the big three are getting in. Um, and I'm wondering if one of the bottom seven will make the tourney at some point in the future. If they don't, it's okay, but 
that would bolster the league as yeah. well. And Mark Few kind of asked for this a couple of years ago. And, and USF probably had the best shot until they tailspin, uh, tailspun at the end of last year uh, of at least getting a look. But, uh, you know, right now, even though Santa Clara's record is really impressive, they've played the second or third worst schedule this season. Now, that'll, that'll improve when they play, you know, just by playing Gonzaga, that'll take an uptick on, on Thursday. And that's maybe the best, not, maybe not the best barometer, but a barometer of how Santa Clara is doing is how competitive they stay uh, in Spokane on Thursday. Yeah, and did pull off the upset against St. Mary's. So it was somewhat, I guess, validated, but yeah. multiple ways of looking at it. And that was their first uh, away win. They'd only played a couple away games, maybe three away that's, games. That's how you win a lot. You play a lot of home games against yeah. nobody. And if there's, if, there's one, if there's one hole in BYU's resume, not that it's a big one, it's, uh, it's true away wins. Uh, they're one and three. Because all three of the overtime losses were yeah, so, and, and the, the road, Yes, and that right? leads me to the fact, that, yeah, they're one and three, but the but being... They were all in overtime. Yeah, and the know? one win is against Houston. And 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 so you know one and three in away games is, is again something that they need to kind of buttress here as the season goes along. They'll get that chance. They've been in the Beehive State for a lot of the last two months. In fact, they've only played one game outside of Utah since Thanksgiving. Okay, that's going to change here in the next month. Yeah, St. Mary's is like, wait, what? That's our thing. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Rubel, the voice of the Cougars on BYU Sports Nation, looking at Gonzaga whether it's statistically speaking or just matchups, what's the toughest matchup for BYU on Saturday? Uh, well, the, the way they go inside um, and the fact that they, the, 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 the fact they restock with guards just so well and so completely is, is one thing about it. But the fact that they can be so long and so skilled inside over and over again, and like Mark Pope said on our show last night, when they want to decide to overpower a team and really are intent on doing that, they can do just that. They can dump it down, dump it down, and get uh, and get performance from from everyone they put inside. But Petrushev is is you know legit. He actually replaced I think Killy and Tilly on the midseason Wooden Award watch list, right? I think Killy, I think Tilly was there to begin the year. Then he got bumped out by his teammate, and and he's you know in in the running for Player of the Year in this league, and and so but he's just one of many many skilled bigs. Uh, and, and they do so well with the overseas recruiting, and it's another, it's another typical Gonzaga roster that way. It's interesting to really see what, what Gonzaga has become in the decades since BYU's joined the league, almost a decade since joining the WCC. Um, their, their recruiting patterns and their, their roster composition looks different now than it did then. They were good then. They're great now. It's it almost, almost like, oh, BYU's going to challenge us. we got to do something different. And when BYU came to the league, BYU blew out Gonzaga. Yeah. A, a shot was fired. It may right? not have been like the trigger for Mark Few, but but BYU handled Gonzaga in the NCAA tournament the year before, as BYU was coming into the league. And again, not not that that was Mark Pope waking up and saying, "Oh, now we got." It. But maybe but, it was something. But yeah. but it was a realization that that BYU coming into the league, everyone's got to raise their level, and certainly Gonzaga modified its approach in a way. And just got better and better and deeper and deeper every year to the point where now uh, they're as much a national powerhouse as any of the Blue Bloods. Yeah, it's the golden age. It's, it's wild. It's, yeah. it's BYU football in the early to mid-1980s for Gonzaga and basketball now. And no matter how good the Mountain West Conference was when BYU was in it and, and Utah was good, it, it was never like this. Yes, where you had never. to beat the number one team in the country to be a conference champion. <laughs> which is what BYU, BYU stuck Crazy. in a league with... Um, Kansas, a Kansas, Duke. a Kentucky, a, a, an Arizona, whatever you want to say, a Duke, uh, wh whoever you want to, you know, hold up as 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 a conference standard bearer. You know, BYU's in that league with that kind of team right now. Greg, great stuff, and uh, we wish you the best. Uh, not just tomorrow, but then your trip to Spokane. Yeah, you know, and you know they, they they've got three wins up there, right? Which is more than uh, you know I think most every other team other than St. Mary's can combine to have in the last decade or plus. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it'll be a, such a great challenge this weekend. If they don't have Yo, um, it would be one of those uh, just again uh, most memorable moments that they can somehow find a way to come together. And they've been doing that so far. It's been fun to watch.